Thank you so much for joining me on the Good Story Podcast. My name is Mary Cole, and with me today, I have writer, writing teacher, ghost writer, and general literary icon, Roz Morris, with me. I am trying to uh, emphasize the vowels are the same. Apparently, I've been saying it wrong this whole time. Roz, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? First of all, let me just say, I am so delighted to be invited to this podcast. Mary, I have followed your writing posts for years and years and years. Ever since I first got onto Twitter, I thought she so knows how to explain, how to tell stories, what the reader needs. And I felt I'd found a kindred spirit. And uh, so it's an absolute privilege to be here today. And now, who am I? I'm, I'm basically a person who absolutely loves stories, love telling stories, love all the mechanics of it. Um, I've, I've worked in publishing all my life in various ways. I, I began by um, running an editorial department. I, I didn't run it when I first joined the company, but I ended up running an editorial department. So I saw how books were made. Um, I always wanted to get into writing, which is why I got into publishing. And um, I happened to meet people who were also writers and they encouraged me to do my my own work and from that I, I learned really about storytelling from the inside and what I have ended up doing is is just story in so many ways. I've been a ghost writer so I've I've written books for other people who put their names on them and I've been um, and still am a writing coach um, I've worked for a literary consultancy where I would take manuscripts and do in-depth reports on them, figuring out what worked, what didn't work, what the writer was trying to do. So it's really trying to wriggle into their minds and see what they really wanted their book to be and to figure out how, how, how they could give that to a reader. I've, um, written books about this, about how to write. Um, it's my series called Nail Your Novel. Um, I've got three books no, four books in that series. I've got a process book, a workbook based on that. I've got a book on how to write characters and a book on how to write plot. And I've got various creative works on my own, which is where I started just, you know, like we all do, a person with an urge to write because there's just something inside that's got to come out. And um, I've done three novels. Um, I released my most recent one uh, just last year. Um, it took about seven years to figure out how to write it. It was quite a, <laughs> quite a demanding book, uh, but it eventually came out the way I wanted it. I mean, it's it was a complex idea, and I just had this feeling there's something really big in here, and I've got to figure out how to make the reader feel it as strongly as I do. And um, I always find that's the the rewarding thing. Um, it's a lot of problem solving. When you get it right, the reader just has a blast of a journey and you feel okay all the work was worth it (laughs) and then I've also got a memoir which was a travel diary that I had hanging around and I I just um, thought one day oh I wonder if I could do something with these and I actually meant to just put them in a novel and then my husband said write them as they are they're great and I thought no one wants a memoir from, from me no one knows who I am but uh, various people said, oh, no, I'd love to read something like that from you. And so I, I wrote it and I had a lot of fun and people liked it. And now um, I've got another one brewing, which is uh, just great. Um, so, yes, I, I write loads and loads of things. But really, at heart, I'm a storyteller. I just love telling stories. To, to sort of uh, go back to the very beginning, uh, I am also surprised that this is the first time we've been sitting down because you and I uh, do similar work. We spin in similar circles. We're both on writing social media. So yes, I, I feel very privileged to have you on and you certainly do a lot. I think I want to put a, uh, a question to you that I think about a lot. When you switch hats uh, from editorial brain to writer brain, what is that shift like for you? Is is that something, does it all fall within the category of storytelling to you? Or do you approach things differently when you're sitting down to write your own work versus working with somebody else on theirs? What a good question. I think it all comes from the same place, really. Um, when I get an idea for myself, I have to figure out 
what would be the best way to treat it? As I said, what will make the reader feel the magic that I feel in there and, and the resonances? And when I pick up a manuscript by another writer, I'm thinking, um, what do they want it to be? What's the potential they see in it? How can I help them feel, make the reader feel it? And how can I help them develop it to its strongest work? So it, it's similar, re really, because I find that each book I write is its own creature. And so is each book that I help an author with. So for you, it really, one thing that you said in your introduction was that you uh, find the intention of the writer. You try to figure out, you get into their head and you try to figure out what that nugget is. Let's call it the nugget or the idea, the feeling, the intention. And is that, it sounds like your own creative ideas, that's how they start as well. You, you get a feeling, you get this idea, you get this urge to sort of transmit it. So for you, it's all about figuring out what that that core of the story is. Yes, it is actually. Yes, I spend a lot of time uh, with an idea, um, kind of interrogating it, and um, writing notes to myself. Um, I'll write a lot of outline notes on index cards and spread them out, and think, what is this telling me? What's what's the there's a big thing in here. I often think there's a big thing that I'm missing and I need to really find it. And I slowly find that my my whole life starts to be taken over by <laughs> the idea. If, it, if it's a really strong idea, it directs me to uh, watch particular movies or to read particular books. And they, they all start kind of speaking to me and saying, what about this? What about this? Um, or is this the feeling you're looking for? Is this the feeling you're looking for? Um, it's much easier for me to do that with someone else's work because I can ask them what, what <laughs> gave you the idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> what are you inspired by? What would you like it to be? And from that, I can, I can figure out how to help them make it like that. And often there's quite a lot of, um, giving, um, craft advice. And, uh, what I find, and you must find this too, when I, when I work with authors is that there are certain things they all do, already do very well because they've taught themselves. They've concentrated on it. They've really noticed it. They've really worked it out as their thing. And then there are other things they're not yet aware of. And that, that's like sort of going to, to ballet class and being taught properly. Okay. This is how you make it look as graceful. This is how you, you take your, your bit that's already good and then make it into something that is going to really work and, and, um, be a pleasing thing. But the, the fundamentals sometimes need to be ironed out. Some writers are very good at imagery or world building or character. And then you sort of build up the other things to support those elements that may not yet be in place. Yes, absolutely. And, and techniques like show, not tell. The number of times um, I've ended up telling somebody, this is actually what you need to do to get the effect that you want in the reader. And it's all, all of the writing craft is learning how to do that to the reader, how to do what you want to do to the reader. So how, I mean, give me, if you can, an example from your own work. How do you, because I, I agree with you 100% that one of the goals of the writing craft is to create emotion in the reader. And if you mm -hmm. are able to transmit at, you know, even 10% of the passion that you feel and the, the excitement that you feel and the idea that you're envisioning in your head, that's a big win, but creating emotion in somebody else is the stuff, the stuff of the writing craft. So can you maybe give an example of how we do that? Because that's such a nice goal to aim for, but what are the nitty gritty tactics that you use to accomplish it? I spend a lot of time noticing how other writers do it, really. I'm a very analytical reader. Um, and I always have been. Uh, it wasn't something I ever had to be taught. I always noticed if a writer was doing something interesting with my emotions or making me notice something. And 
I'm a very slow reader and always have been. Uh, I did a, a degree in English literature and it was hell because I couldn't keep up with reading. I would get lost in a book. I mean, one book of Dickens could have done my whole degree. <laughs> it was, there was just so much. And because I am such a noticer, what I do is I, I take, I, I, I look very closely at what a writer is doing how they're using particular words, even the shapes of the words, not just what they mean, but the, the way they look on the page and the fall of a line, the order that the words are put in, all of those things add up to the way you make the reader feel. And I've always loved this. I've always loved noticing this. And um, really, I think if there is a secret, that is it. Notice what... A writer is doing to you when you are responding to it. And you pull from, it sounds like movies, you pull from other media, not just writing, to to sort of break down how people are, I want to say manipulating, but not in a bad way, how people are sort of working with an audience. Yes, yes. And I think all art is manipulation in a way, because they draw your attention to something, usually in a way that you haven't seen it before or experienced it before. And um, in fact, all art is is sort of keeping, all good artists, I think, keep tight control over your, your feelings and your thoughts. Um, an example that I use when I teach um, a class about pace is how most artistic media have got a very good sense of where your attention is and how long they can spend on a particular thing before they they need to show you something new. Um, if you're making a video, apparently there's a sweet spot of 15 seconds before you should change something, anything, but you just have to keep showing change. And it's the same in music as well. If you listen to any pop song, verse one will not sound exactly the same as verse two. Verse two will build on verse one. It won't be exactly the same. And verse three and all the, the choruses and everything, it will always be changing slightly. So you're always being, your attention is always being, being drawn back to it. Um, and I even wonder if um, this might be a, a quite a primeval um, survival thing, actually, because... In the wilds, we're probably wired to notice things changing. So we notice things changing and they keep our attention. So, um, that this is, this is how good artists keep us involved in what they're doing. They, they keep, keep us looking and they often show us something in a way that's not quite as we expect, but is still really compelling. That's got quite deep. <laughs> I love this. I love this idea of um, change and pacing. So when a scene maybe runs out of steam, you insert a character, you insert a scene change, you insert an, a setting change, you sort of keep the reader engaged by feeding them novel information or setting or dialogue. Uh, if you have too much dialogue, maybe you go into some introspection. You sort of keep things moving in that way because that's what sends flags up to the reader. I want, out of my own personal curiosity, what do you think is the most compelling emotion to create within that reader? Oh, all sorts of things. Mystery is very good. Yes. People love a mystery. If you've got a mystery, you're dangling. You know, how did this happen? Why is always far more interesting than what? Mm. And um, something I always respond to is a sense of yearning. If you've got a character who just deeply wants something. Um, I mean, Kurt Vonnegut said that every character should want something, even if it's only a glass of water, but that there's, there is a, a deep sense of want that you can see in a character, often see in a character, and it's, it's very attractive. And it, it makes, makes you feel like you're seeing something very genuine and even quite vulnerable in them. So I think those I find those very attractive. 
Um, I think if a scene seems to be going on too long, that's always a very interesting question because why is it going on too long? It might be that you've actually got too many beats. You've got too many new things happening. And the reader gets to a point where they think, I've had enough. Oh, no, there's more. I don't know if I can cope with more. And in fact, you might be shortchanging a story point by not letting the scene land on it. We talk a lot about reaction beats being important, not just new information, new information, change, twist, reversal, whatever, all of these things that are sort of coming at your character from the plot, at some point, they do need a quiet moment, whether alone or with somebody else, to synthesize some of that. Because the new information, that's the what, but how it affects the character, how it changes anything, the resonance of it, I think some writers neglect the ripple effect that their new information, they're building it into the plot. They're doing their job. They're throwing the what, what, what at your character. A reaction beat is a really nice way to take a step back and let some of that land. Absolutely. So that's something that we, we talk a lot about, just that synthesis. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I, I quite often see... Um, stories that aren't working because the writer, as you say, they, they've got this and then this and then this, but we actually don't, we don't get time to assimilate it with the character who it matters to. And we sometimes don't get to see how it matters to them mm -hmm. or why it matters to them. And then also what it makes them do next. That's very important. And a story will seem much more natural if you have these elements, so take time to give a reaction beat um, and, and to explore what the consequences are for the person who has experienced this. Um, I think a good, a good story helps you experience something in a, in a wholehearted way mm. um, alongside a character. And um, that experience includes reaction and consequences as well as the actual events that are startling or shocking. And that's how you get stakes. You get this sort of order of magnitude of why it matters. You know, something in the scene went well, now what? And, you know, so what, what are the consequences? Something went poorly. What are the ramifications of that? And that can really bring it back to what matters to the character, what the character wants. I think a point not to be neglected that you made is that wanting is universal. Yearning is universal, but it's also vulnerable. I mean, it takes mm -hmm. guts to admit that you want something. It takes a certain amount of sort of bearing your underbelly to to put out into the world that you want something, that you yearn, that you hope. Um, even if it's, you know, even if the character is very strong, their yearning is something that opens them to the reader in a pretty intimate way. I think that's a great way to think about character and what matters to character. And uh, you could open up story potential by putting obstacles in the way of what they're yearning for, you know, but, but that yearning, I think, is what connects the reader. Yes, and I think it's it's incredibly attractive, and um, it's often worth thinking about real life and how events in real life and people in real life make us feel. We're usually the most curious about the people who have got something that doesn't add up. You know, imagine two people in a relationship, and you're and you know we all talk about our friends' relationships, don't we? And and we, you know, we sort of analyze and we think, I don't think he's quite the right person for her, or I think she wants something more. And that is incredibly interesting. And it's the, when you see something that's, where someone seems to have something missing, that's really interesting. And it is, as you say, it's, it's vulnerable and it, it feels like you're seeing something very private. And also they, they may not know themselves. And that makes a very interesting character to write about because you can then put them in a situation where an inner need 
and an outer need are going to cause friction. And the characters are going to think, well, I, I want this, but I don't really want it, but I do want it. And all sorts of wonderful complications can come out of that. I actually did have in um, the novel I've, I, I published last year, I had a character who um, was had become a bit of a celebrity because she was uh, she used to go out with a very famous pop star who was uh, then killed in a mountaineering accident, and she's been trying to kind of live a quiet life ever since. And um, everything, every so often, people keep coming back to her and say, "Well, oh, would you would you just get involved in this because you you know you went out with him, you were the love of his life, and so on." And she's an artist now. And um, somebody a- approaches her and says, oh, "I'd really like you to make some artworks that are about him." And she has always sort of shied away from that. But there's also a little piece of her that's thinking. I do want to do this. And she doesn't want to do it. And she does want to do it. And she has a conversation with him where she's, she's kind of saying to herself, if I don't do this, someone else will. And I can't stand that. And it's just this impossible situation, two things she wants. And it, it's, I, I absolutely love that kind of situation for a story where you, you've got someone who, um, is confronted with, some things that are not compatible they're not going to go together and they they really will have to work it out and and it often makes them do things this is another thing you you start with an urge like that but then you have to make it make the characters do things and then you get quite a complex human story when absolutely anything could happen according to whatever you're writing but the this inner complication can make for some great stories So I have a question about that. So we're talking about the want, which is sort of the uh, forward facing uh, objective that a character has something that they can say and uh, express that they want. And then the need sometimes to your example, operates underneath the surface, maybe they want this career in front of other people, but they need to be taken seriously by a close circle of friends or whatever the case may be. So their want and their need are actually in at odds with one another, which creates a lot of great friction. How do you create a, a juicy need for a character? Want, want can be pretty obvious, um, but the need is often a little bit more, I don't know, nebulous. Yes, I, I, again, I create, um, these characters by thinking, thinking a lot about, and I'm interested in the complication to start with, I think. So I will think this situation, I can see some good possibilities. So what is it? What if this? What if that? What if she did want that? What if she didn't want that? And, um, playing around and thinking, what what might expose, as you say, their, their vulnerable underbelly and put them in a situation that seems to eventually become, you know, a thing that will make them make a big choice that might change their life. Choices are really important. I think you have to think about how you are going to confront a character with choices that are difficult. And then again, that is that is a very attractive thing in story terms. Because as readers, we're thinking, well, what will they do? We can see this is, this is not easy. And if, if she does one thing, then that. If she does the other thing, then that. Uh, she doesn't want that. She doesn't want that. Um, and, and then also you can bring in other people who will be affected by whatever it is. And, and this is, this is a fundamental, um, aspect of story that will work whatever you, whatever genre you're writing, whether you're writing kind of, um, quite, story driven literary like I do or writing a thriller um, or a fantasy the, those kind of opposing needs the real push pull in a person's soul it's always compelling so you have written you've written the book on how to write a book you've written about character you've written about plot in in this series do you find yourself a character writer or a plot writer I'm not saying that we have to pick sides necessarily and they're very interwoven but i find that a lot of people 
a lead with one over the other? Yeah, that's that's a, a good question. Um, I find I lead, I lead with characters, but what I start with is a situation that makes me think, oh, there's a lot to mine in here. Um, with the the novel that I was talking about, the the inspiration actually was um, a, a story about a, a guy who fell into a glacier and um, his body was just stuck in there. And he's sort of gradually kind of coming through the glacier and the people who knew him are thinking, well, any time he might pop out and we kind of, our lives are on hold because we know he's he's dead, but he's not quite gone. Mm, and, so there's no closure. Um, no closure. And from that, I thought, this is so interesting. What, just what might this do to people? And I gradually built up a, a chorus of people who were highly affected by this. And at some point, I, I decided he would be a, a famous rock star, which just meant the whole world was kind of on tenterhooks for him to come back. But it, for me, it came from a situation and then thinking, what kind of people would have various difficulties with this and separate difficulties too? Because they have to be, if you're going to have an ensemble cast, for instance, as I do in this novel, you have to have a number of different kinds of personalities who react in different ways to the various challenges. And, and um, it, it sort of just gives them uh, different life dilemmas. Um, and from that I started thinking okay we know this person is like this what would push their buttons what plot elements would push their buttons and and I did that for each person so the plot came out of the things they would find most difficult um mm. but when I've when I've ghostwritten novels I've, I've ghostwritten quite a lot of thrillers uh what I would do is start with a, a situation again but I I would think okay from this situation there are certain things that the reader will want to see because of say the special world of the story so I'll think what are those so I've got to I've got to give them this and this and this or they're going to be disappointed then I've got to give it to them in a new way and then from that I will think um, who are the characters I need to give the reader the most interesting ride through this? And then what are their personalities going to be? So I kind of design, um, I, I choose a way around uh, according to what I'm writing, what kind of audience I'm writing for. If I'm writing for, for my kind of audience, then I generally tend to start with the situation and, and the people and, and then tease the plot out of that. If I'm writing something that is more, plot based like a thriller then i i will think okay i know there are certain kinds of beats i have to to hit in surprising ways i better s start with those and then find the ways to make people who will give the the reader the best ride so i was really uh looking forward to asking about some of the ghost writing um so how how is a ghost writing project presented to you? How much creative liberty do you have? I mean, with a thriller, you obviously want to keep in mind some of the tropes, some of the expectations of your audience with a thriller. Um, but when you come on as a ghostwriter, so I would imagine you're getting at least the core of the idea, or if you're stepping into an existing series, you're getting sort of a Bible. And then what? How how much guidance uh, do you have? How much freedom do you have? And how much do you work with the originator of the series or story or the writer? Each project is different. Um, sometimes the publisher will have a very strong idea. We want the series to be, if it's a series, we want it to be like this and this and this. Or they might say, uh, we want some books like this person's books. Usually they're thinking, these are sold well, so what can you do that will give us a slice of that pie too? It's very, very commercial. Um, if I'm, if I'm working with, with a writer who's got an idea, then I, I go with that to make it as much of their signature as possible. Usually they are, um, well known in some respect. So, the reader will expect to see um, some of that life that they already know about reflected in the writing of the book. So really, I, I just kind of 
notice what is wanted with the project and and then it, it's it's like building a house for somebody really um i'm kind of the architect and the um ex executor of the books and i use what i know about creating stories um to to give the the, the client something that is what they want and do you, uh, what kind of research do you do or is there interaction with the client? Uh, is there, do they read and give you feedback and then you revise? I mean, how do you, when you step into the shoes of another writer or another idea, how do you hone that instrument? Um, there's a lot of research. Um, often the, um, the client will give me research of their own or I can, I can ask them lots of questions um, I usually have to do a lot more research my own because there are always lots of details that you find as you're writing something you think oh I don't know how to describe that um, the internet makes this a lot more easy than it used oh, to be oh my goodness yes yes <laughs> um, I mean sometimes once I had to, to write a novel where uh, people went scuba diving and I've never scuba dived <laughs> so <laughs> I did have a local a dive shop just up the road. So I went in there one one morning and said, I've got to write a novel about people scuba diving. Can you give just tell me what I need to know? And uh, and that was great because I could smell the stuff and feel it and put it on and see what everything felt like. Um so there's always a lot of um a lot of research that you have to do for yourself to create an authentic experience um and and then you you give it to the publisher and um the or the, the client but usually the publisher will be your intermediary and sometimes the client won't read it at all <laughs> and and sometimes they do um it's it, every every project's different but i always try to to make sure i do enough research for the book to be as solid as possible and, and i have had people write to to me right i got the letters forwarded from the the publisher and they said oh yeah that was very authentic you can really tell me that um there's such and such person has done these things i thought i've never done any <laughs> of those things <laughs> I have never abseiled from a helicopter, for instance. But, <laughs> well, how do you it's, connect? So is it is it sensory? Is it putting on, you know, scuba tanks are very heavy. A lot of people don't realize. Is it, yeah. is it sort of, um, how do you flesh out those experiences? And this goes for ghostwriting, but it also goes for any kind of writing. I mean, how do you... How do you put those details? What details do you think are most salient and how do you bring them to the page? Well, I do a lot of, a lot of research to find out how things feel and um, how they emotionally feel as well and how you think in particular situations if you are used to doing particular things. So um, for, for the novel I, I described to you, um, there was a lot of high altitude mountain climbing and I've never been up Everest, but <laughs> I do know how to describe it. And, um, because of my, uh, my solid background in ghostwriting of getting to know what details would make a convincing read, then I, I've, I've got quite good at asking and knowing what to ask and with with my own novels when i've when i've had um i've had to write about things i've i've never done i've i've been lucky enough to find people who would read the manuscript and point out the the areas where where i'd got things wrong you still you do really need an expert reader if you are writing about things that that you haven't done because there will always be something that you've got wrong but but yes and your, your point about the scuba tanks i do remember noting that thinking oh right well i better be careful i better not have anyone running with them on <laughs> <laughs> i i have gone scuba diving a couple of times and it gets easier in the water right you're not on land with those things most of the time, but that is something a lot of people, you're, to your point, may not appreciate or may not even know that you you can't really run with a with an oxygen tank on your back that well. Yeah, I I do a lot of horse riding, and something I've always found that I notice in books is when people get get details wrong about 
what you can and can't do with a horse and or how difficult it would be to do them. They, they seem to assume that they're like motorbikes. You just get on and it will do whatever you want. No, <laughs> they won't. Um, but you can actually get some really interesting story situations out of doing that kind of detailed research. The moment you find you can't do something you think that you want the characters to do, that is a real opportunity, actually. It's usually an opportunity to to go beyond what the reader expects and to take the reader a bit by surprise as well. And we're, we're always, we were talking earlier about things changing. Um, a good writer will always be thinking about what the reader is expecting and giving them something slightly different or maybe very different. So research of physical things um, that your characters are doing can be a really good source of this kind of surprise. And something you always want is to make things far more difficult for characters yes. than they expected them to be. Never have a situation, where, a situation where someone thinks, well, I'll just find somebody's name and then I'll go and talk to them. No, no, make that difficult. That could be a whole passage of the book. One of the things that I find myself uh, talking about a lot, because a lot of the advice that I give is modulated for middle grade and young adult writers. So situations out in the world, you're not going to have a wide ranging Dan Brown style thriller necessarily, unless you're Artemis Fowl. Um, so I see a lot of writers give us characters where they make a guess and the guess is correct and yeah. they find a clue and it magically works out on the first try. And so uh, coaching writers to work in those complications, to subvert those expectations, to put an obstacle in the character's path is something that I find myself doing a lot because when, when a character is right all the time, or they take risks and the risks always pay off. That's a little too easy, I think. Absolutely. And the reader always knows you can make it easy for the characters. They know you can do whatever you like. <laughs> One of the, the chief ways you make a reader suspend disbelief is by showing them it's not easy. Mm -hmm. you know, they, and um, here's, an, here's an interesting um an interesting point I, I often find when, when people are writing action scenes. Um, so if two people are having a, a fight, for instance, and actually fights are really boring to read. About. Yeah. Oh, oh I <laughs> um, completely agree. Yeah. Um, so you have to sort of try and make them a lot more interesting. I had to write a lot of fight scenes in the, in the thrillers and oh my goodness. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what you must, the thing that you must do is, is actually try and um, take the reader's mind off the action because the, the reader knows you can make so-and-so knock someone out if they need to. And so that is not interesting to read about. <laughs> but if you watch something like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, fights rules about character because everyone knows very well, you know, the fight will turn out exactly as the story needs. So just don't even make them look at the fight. Have the fight do something else like have it have it reveal character or have somebody find out about something else or something else happens while they're having the fight. That, that is much more interesting. So in any situation where it's it, you're just going to have some action, so someone is driving the car and it skids and the reader, the, the, re, the writer often imagines the reader will be thinking, oh, will they get out of the skid? Um, that, um, no, actually, the reader isn't really th wondering about that because the reader knows you have already decided. So you need something else to actually keep the reader's attention. That's a really interesting point. I think we're talking a lot about the the audience's point of view throughout this conversation and how anticipating and preempting what the reader might be thinking will help you make decisions that end up hooking the reader. So who is manipulating who in, the, in this scenario? Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Um, I often think a writer is like um, those very good illusionists. In, in this country, we have Darren Brown, who can, and he is so in control of everything you are thinking and feeling and everything he's making you look at and misdirecting you. And I think a good storyteller has to be like that. 
they'll set something up and they'll they'll think, oh, but I've actually smuggled this in and you didn't notice but it was there all along. <laughs> and then when I make you look at it, they'll think, that was a great twist. But no, it was there all the time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so then how does the craft of shaping story get a little bit more complicated when it's your story, when the events that you are cherry picking from have actually happened to you, you're writing a memoir and you can't just choose from your bag of tricks necessarily, or can you? I mean, how is the experience of creative nonfiction compared to fiction? Well, it was a very interesting exercise um, for my for my own memoir because I couldn't make anything up, but I had to figure out what was the truth beyond just the events. And um, that's the real story you're telling. It's the, the kind of through line of truths. Th those are the things that are worth sharing with other people. The actual events are maybe not that interesting, but it, it's the universal aspects of life that that readers will recognize and will start to tune into. And I find when I'm coaching people with memoirs, um, that's that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for ways to help them cherry pick. Not everything can go in. Um, cherry pick a strong through line to tell a story that will resonate with quite a lot of people. We've all been in a situation where someone has told them what, told you what happened to them today and you think, oh, so what? But if they somehow have a sense of make, including you in it in a way that um, sounds like something that might have happened to them or that they might warm to or understand, that's a totally different thing. So I think that's what, what, what you do with a memoir. You, you start off with, all sorts of possible events that could go in. But then you have to, to think of what you're telling that's not just about you. It's about confiding and helping a, a reader almost, um, share, share their own world with you in, in the process of reading. I think, I mean, <laughs> This conversation has had so many common threads that we keep pulling at, but I think thinking about audience in memoir for fiction, the audience wants to feel something. They want to be entertained. When somebody sits down with you uh, in the form of reading your memoir, I do think that they are primarily thinking about themselves and mm. any insights any experiences that they can glean from the memoir. I think that the need of the audience member, the reader, is very different in memoir. I see them as coming for some kind of community, some kind of common aspect that they can find. They may not share your experience, but they are hoping to see a story of resilience. They are hoping to see a story of redemption. They are sort of maybe going through something and they want to know that somebody else has gone through something similar. The events almost don't matter. It's maybe what you glean from those events and that you're able to then turn around and share with somebody else. That to me seems like the heart, at least of contemporary memoir, this kind of more confessional, authentic, I survived this, I triumphed over X, Y, Z. And, but there's also that, and so can you, because you're then connecting to what the reader might be going through. Yes, and I love those books. Um, they they speak to something in our common humanity, don't they? Um, I recently read a memoir. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but it was its subtitle was "A Year of Not Sleeping." Mm. Amazing. Uh, this this woman hardly slept for an entire year, and she describes it so beautifully. I think her name is Samantha Harvey. I'm going to look and it up right now. It's it's it is just it's a an experience at the edge of most of our experiences. The Shapeless Unease. That's it, yes. What a title. 
it is wonderful and um you just think what must that be like and she she goes into experiences that are in some ways experiences we recognize because we know what it's like to not be able to get to sleep and how that kind of just wears us ragged and um and and the dread of not being able to get to sleep if you if you can't and but she has gone much further so there's there's an extreme in her experience but it starts as something we all do experience from time to time but she's taken it to the edge so that I love these stories from the the edges of experience that 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 are still somehow very relatable. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that is uh, the nugget that launches a lot of memoir is something incredible or outside the norm or on the edge does happen in your life. And then the memoir is you building a bridge between that thing that only you experienced, or maybe you and your siblings, if it's like, you know, the glass castle family story type of memoir, but building that bridge to the reader and what the reader might be going through. Yes, yes. And it's when you are constructing that kind of story, it's, it's good to seek these notes of common experience to think, what is it that will enable me to keep the reader with me. Um, although some of these situations, they're not all extremes, you do get memoirs that are much quieter. But um, the, the thing the reader is hoping to do is step into the writer's shoes and think, oh yeah, I do understand how that feels. I felt a bit like that myself, maybe. Um, and, and that's what keeps it from being unrelatable. Mm -hmm. And I think so when you are reaching out as a writer to the reader in this way, I do think that there is a prerequisite of some self-awareness, some soul searching um, that is, is a hallmark of contemporary memoir. But I do think some measure of self-awareness is, is crucial to the writing craft in general. Yes, I think it is. Um, I find it most strongly in the way we we judge our characters mm. and and the the way we will be sympathetic to some people and not to others. I find it's always really interesting to see in a in a manuscript a character who's very unsympathetically presented, and I always want to know what would it be like if the writer kind of just put down their hostility towards them and tried to understand them for themselves. And uh, you know, it, it, this doesn't mean you, you always have to be sympathetic to every character, but you might be missing a real opportunity to write someone far more interesting mm -hmm. by really understanding what it's like to be them. I'm thinking here of the idea that every villain thinks that they're a hero. You know, we yes. may see. If, I was thinking that too. From the outside, they look villainous. You know, they're the antagonist, but they're not, they don't wake up every day saying, mmm, evil. How can I, you know, how can I be more evil? They believe misguidedly, perhaps, in what they're doing and why they're doing it. They're as driven as any hero. They're just driven in kind of a different, <laughs> a different direction. Yes, um, and I, I can't remember who said this, but something I read a long time ago that that, that really stuck with me was that um, every, with a villain, it might be an actor who was talking about this, but it was um, find why it's good to be them mm. Mm -hmm. because then you'll play them in a fully rounded human way. Um, but you, I often find in, in manuscripts, there'll be certain characters that the writer has a blind spot about. And I'm thinking that there's a way here in which you, you could be kinder to them and just see what, what happens. It's, it's always worth trying. I'm thinking of, so I'm very late on the train, uh, to watching Succession, where I think everybody's, Big comment, though, is that everybody is so unlikable. But what I think that show does really well is it shows us 
those characters in their quiet moments, those characters in their yearning to bring it back completely full circle. But all of those characters just are so hurt and they need so much, but they would rather die than, than show that any of them need anything. But it's just very interesting to see them all jockeying for a position. But if we flip that and we look under the lid a little bit, they're all jockeying for love and kind of esteem and even self-esteem. That's just been such a fascinating character study, even though every episode leaves me feeling just oh, gutted. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love Succession. And I'm so glad you mentioned it because, yes, those characters, they are, they are in constant turmoil. They are, as you say, they're looking for, for love and self acceptance. Um, some of them are, are sort of finding it hard to live with themselves. They have urges and they can't help themselves. Um, and there's no way they'll let someone else in the family <laughs> get one over on them that sort of really sort of makes them just do things that they they can't they really have full control over it is so interesting and i also i also love that the moments where you see how peculiar their lives are um and i i don't want to give any spoilers but that, and, I, and i'll be careful not to but they all one day decide to meet somewhere and they turn up in helicopters this is just not like the rest of our lives Every time, every time one of them gets in a helicopter, I'm just like, oh my God, you know, cause their, their problems at the end of the day, though, their problems are so basic, but they live on such a grand scale and the stakes are so high because it's this, you know, family business empire. But I, yeah, I, and they all go to like some warehouse sex party. It's just, it's, I think it, it's this wonderful character study splashed against this larger than life world. And I think that's what really makes it so irresistible. Yes. And it is, as we've been saying, that the characters are so understandable because they are, they are driven by these things we all recognize. Um, these, these vulnerabilities and the, and rivalries. Rivalries are brilliant. Everyone has rivalries within <laughs> families or with, oh, you know, people we've known for decades. This is, it's all so understandable at a really basic level. And uh, I think you'll never go wrong if you put things like that in a story because they were always, push people's buttons when people's buttons are pushed they they do things that are usually going to cause trouble so know who your character is and then put them in situations where they have to make a choice or they have to react or something pushes against their wants or their needs i want to be mindful of time so i guess i'll ask you how do you get to know that character? Because your approach is getting to know the author, getting to know their intentions, really getting at that deep seed. So when it comes to character, how do you play detective? How do you investigate who that person is at their core? Um, a lot of thinking. Um, I write notes to myself about what they might think about particular things. I find it helps to just to look at their expectations perhaps um with with the novel that that i that i finished last year i i wrote a chart of how they all felt about love actually what they thought it should be and what their experiences of it were and i found they're all quite different i had actually seven um viewpoint characters which was quite a, a headache to manage but it, it it just needed it the story needed that but what i did was i i made a chart and just wrote right what did this character expect of love what did this character expect and they all sort of started really forming quite distinct and different personalities just from that one question so and was was like, love something you were working with thematically was that i mean if you hear you, you describe the plot, it's, you know, a guy in a glacier, um, which doesn't outwardly speak to the topic of love. So was love kind of an underpinning theme? It was very much because, um, the, 
the world loved him because he was a singer, because his songs had come along at a time when they were all teenagers. Mm. And the songs you liked as a teenager were how you felt about yourself, about the world, about the people oh, who... A hundred percent. I yeah. My musical taste has not moved much beyond what I got into when I was 15, 16. <laughs> exactly. So those songs tell you who you were then, but also really the, the core of who you are now as well, in a way. And um, there, was, there was that. There was the, the girlfriend he had at the time who was still regarded by the whole world as his lover, mm -hmm. even though she'd moved on. She was trying to do other things. And she was trying to have love affairs of her own. And, and all that was sort of changing. I kind of built the book really out of the ideas of love, mm. what, what these people were yearning for. I just love yearning. Yes. And, and sort of the big mystery that they had to solve of how to live now. Well, actually, this guy is still in the mountains and sort of coming down. He's like the song of their lives. Yeah. Stuck. And, you know, you put on a record and it is the, that moment in time frozen. So this all sort of started to hit me in a great big wave. And I thought, love is the key to this book feel about each other, how they want to get, what they want to get out of love now, what they wanted then. So, so that's why love was a really big thematic question to, to use, to explore the people. And from that, you know, they, they kind of emerged as, as people of their own. So their relationships to themselves, their relationship to your theme really gave you a clear sense of character. And I would imagine from there, the plot started popping up, you know, the, the former uh, girlfriend of this singer wanted love in the present. And then you have, you know, other, other people coming to the forefront, plot starts developing. But I think that's really, really interesting that it seemed to have started or crystallized for you uh, in a meditation on their point of view on your theme. Yes, really. It was... It was what they expected of life mm -hmm. and how it had maybe fulfilled them or disappointed them. Um, and it, it, was, it just gave me the, the really deep seated sense of who they were and what they were looking for. Some of them were quite happy and some of them were really not. They were kind of striving still. There was one who was um, a musician who worked with, with mm. the, the other one and he was still striving to be recognized. So he wanted the love of the world. Yeah, I would imagine being in the shadow of somebody like that would uh, would really set a character up for a lot of yearning. Mm, yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. You keep saying the book I released last year. What's the title of it? Oh, it's it's uh, this one. It's called, because it's, it's set on Mount Everest, Ever Rest. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Well, thank you so much for all of your insights. I could talk to you, I mean, forever. I have long so suspected like uh, you were a kindred spirit, and I'm so happy to have made it official. <laughs> uh, Roz Morris, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. This, uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. So wide ranging. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes, I, I could talk to you forever as well. And, and as I said, you know, I've, I've long... Um, appreciated your posts and thought, yes, she thinks like I do. This is great. <laughs> oh, well, your viewpoint, I think, has given listeners a ton to think about and just so much wisdom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Cole. This is uh, the Good Story Podcast. Thank you again, Roz, for joining us. And thank you for having me. And here's to a good story. <laughs>